Today I want to look at how God provides. We're going to look at a few different areas of the Bible, but we'll focus mostly on Luke 10, the first 11 verses, as you can see up there. When I think about God providing, when we think about provision in this world, we have lots of different ideas about what it means to be provided for. And sometimes even in the church there can be unhealthy teaching on the idea of provision because the world has sometimes gone a little bit crazy when it comes to what it means to be provided for. It was only a few years ago that this art installation sold for 120,000 US dollars. And it didn't last long. Like, I don't know, do they give you like, like coupons for new bananas to replace it after it rots? I mean, th this whole thing was just, it's just amazing, right? Somebody saw this. It was called, the, by the way, the title of this piece is The Comedian. I'm not sure who's laughing. I'm thinking it's the artist. Paint a wall off-white, take a banana, tape it to it, 120,000. If that wasn't bad enough, this beautiful piece, Blue Stripe, sold for 43.8 million US dollars. Some people are very well provided for, especially apparently modern artists. But I bring this up because when we talk about God's provision, I'm not saying he's going to give you everything you want. I'm not saying that we're all going to be filthy rich or have opportunities to have bananas hanging on our wall. Although if you really want the banana on your wall, by the way, I'll do it for like 120,000 kroner, like I'm really cheap and I'll do it this week. Um, but when we talk about God's provision, it's that God always provides everything you need to accomplish the mission he's called you to. He's never going to call you to something he doesn't provide for. And so we can walk in faith in that, knowing that he's going to provide. Sometimes it's difficult in life because sometimes we get a challenge. Maybe it's from a teacher or a boss, or maybe from a spouse, like when Scotty sends me to the store to find some item that like I've never bought before. Anybody else have that experience? And like 45 minutes later, Timothy, how can you raise your hand? You're not married. <laughs> We've got some discussing to do. <laughs> Anyhow, maybe we should just stop right there and I was gonna assume it was your parents sending you there, but um, yeah, we, we've, we've had these experiences, right? And I've gone to the store and I've gotten so frustrated looking and looking and looking and I'm not very good at looking for things in general, which is why I got married, because when I need like, where's my pants? My wife always knows. And then she sends me off on these wild goose chases and it's really discouraging and disheartening. And in the same way, you've probably been in situations in school or at work or in other parts of your life where you had a challenge that you really felt unequipped for. And you feel like you're going to fail, and maybe you have failed before. Maybe there's been situations where you did not accomplish the challenge you were given by someone. And that can be not only disheartening and discouraging, it can result in really negative impacts, right? You can get fired, or you can be set back in school, or whatever it may be. But God always empowers us to overcome any challenge he gives us. Earthly teachers, bosses, spouses, sometimes we make unrealistic expectations on other people and we don't always give them the support they need to accomplish those, those challenges. You might have done the same thing to someone else. You may have given somebody a challenge they couldn't overcome because we're not always realistic. But God not only knows your limits and abilities, he empowers you to overcome. This is why David, when he faces Goliath, he doesn't focus on how big the giant is, he focuses on how big God is. He knows the provision will come to overcome. And over and over in, this, in the scriptures, we have stories about this. Joshua and Caleb, they go into the land as spies. They see the, the giants in the land, while ten other spies go, we, we can't do this. These guys are huge. They've got much better battle, you know, armaments and weapons. We've been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. I'm sorry, not 40 years yet. They hadn't done that part. We've been wandering in the wilderness. We've been slaves in Egypt. We don't have the equipment that they have. And yet Joshua and Caleb, they said, eh, it's fine. Why? because they knew that God would provide. And so we need to be the same kind of people of faith. That whatever God calls you to, he's going to provide. He provides 100% of what is needed to accomplish his will 100%. He doesn't call you to something and say, well, let's see how you do with this one. Oh, okay, 92. No, no, no. he calls you to things that he wants you to fully walk in, fully enjoy his presence, him working with you. Now, it's not always easy 
God provides, but he's rarely early, he's never late, and he's absolutely trustworthy. And this can be the difficulty sometimes, that we would really like to have the provision before we have the mission. But it doesn't work that way. We often get the mission before the provision. Think about, again, all the biblical stories. Abram is told to take his son, Isaac. And Abraham takes Isaac to sacrifice him. And he says God will provide. If you read the story, he says God's going to provide. He tells Isaac that. But he doesn't see it yet. At this point, he's supposed to sacrifice his son. He gets all the way to lifting the dagger up to sacrifice his son. And then God provides a scapegoat. But the mission came before the provision. The provision sure wasn't early, but it wasn't late. It was just in time. And how many other stories like this in the Bible can you think of? Moses gets a mission. Go back to Egypt and tell Pharaoh to free my people. Moses, how can I do this? I have trouble speaking. And who am I to do this? And yet God not only gives him, supplies his needs through his brother who can speak, but also through supernatural power. But he doesn't even have his brother with him in the wilderness. He can't sit down with Aaron and say, okay, Aaron, what do you think about this? Are you on board? Let's take a vote. <laughs> do we have unan unanimous vote here? No. He has to set out trusting when he gets to Egypt, his brother, it's been 40 years since he's been there, and he grew up in a palace. His brother didn't. There could be all kinds of issues, and he trusts that when I get there, my brother's going to work with me. God's going to have moved in his heart for that. He trusts that God is going to give me the power to do what's needed. But it's not like God, it's not like he spent a month in the wilderness with God where God said, okay, here's how you turn your staff into a serpent. Oh, look, there's a, there's a river. Why don't you turn it to blood? He doesn't get to practice ahead of time. He doesn't have that provision ahead of time. He gets the mission, and the provision comes just when he needs it. And so God calls on us to be on mission with him and to trust him for the provision. And sometimes it's at the very last moment as we walk in faith that we experience that provision. I was reading this, story, this week a story of James Spurgeon. Now you may have thought I got the name wrong. But James Spurgeon was a poor pastor who's the grandfather of the much more famous Charles Spurgeon. And so this story comes with Charles Spurgeon himself, talking about his grandfather and his grandfather's faith in God. Charles Spurgeon said, he had a large family, so his grandfather, and a very small income. But he loved his Lord, and he would not have given up his preaching of the gospel for anything. One day the cow on which the family relied for milk for the children suddenly died. James Spurgeon's wife was greatly concerned, but he said, God said he would provide, and I believe he could send us 50 cows if he pleased. Now talk about trusting God's provision. We take things for granted so much, it's not the end of the story, but we, we take things for granted so much, right? We get up in the morning, we pour a glass of water from the tap or the fridge, we don't even think about it. Yet so many people in the world, that's a huge luxury, and that to us is a basic necessity. And there's so many things we take for granted until something doesn't work, right? Like, have you ever had your microwave stop working? Now, depending on where you're from, some of you don't use microwaves, and others of us, like, we don't know how you've lived without a microwave. Like, that's how you have sustenance. And when it goes out, we're like, I guess I'm going to die. <laughs> I guess I should just get right with God, and because we're so dependent on it, and yet again, what a luxury. But we take these things for granted. Here they have a cow. They have to literally milk the cow to have milk for the kids, and the cow dies. And you can imagine James Spurgeon's wife was quite concerned. But James, just full of faith, said, as, we, as Charles quoted, James said, God said he would provide, and I believe he could send us 50 cows to be pleased. On that same day, a group met in London. A group James Spurgeon did, James Spurgeon did not know that wanted to help meet the needs of poor pastors. They raised a large sum of money and began sending it to different pastors in need to help their families. When they reached the end of the list, there was five pounds left. One man suggested we could spend, send the last five pounds to James Spurgeon. Then another spoke up and said, no, let's not send just five pounds. Let me add five more to go with it. Others joined in, and the day after his cow died, James Spurgeon received 20 pounds in the mail. Now, y'all don't look impressed enough because you're thinking like, okay, 20 pounds. But to put that in perspective, this is around 1800. 
the average annual wage in the UK for a bailiff was 20 pounds. This was more than James Spurgeon made an entire year. But it wasn't there the day the cow died. He didn't have the money in the bank account to say, oh, well, honey, it's okay, I can buy another cow. We've got money saved. We were wise with our expenses. No, 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 no. He had nothing to go on it. Cow's dead. What are we going to do? Oh, God will provide. Next day, there it is in abundance. It may not be selling a banana for $120,000, but it is the provision that's needed. And that's what we're talking about today is God knows your needs. God knows what he has called you to, and he's going to provide what you need to accomplish what he has called you to. Now, why does this matter so much to me? This matters because trusting God's provision matters because we are called to walk by faith and not by sight. You see, in, in our lives of faith, God has called us to be willing to walk by faith, to trust that he is going to provide. And, and we don't often get to see it. We don't always get to see the provision before it happens. And this isn't just about money like James Spurgeon. This is provision for a supernatural power. It's provision to have the right words to speak in a situation. It's provision to overcome temptation. It's provision. Everything God provides for us, we need whatever it is to accomplish his mission. But you think about it, in, in many of the stories in the Bible, they had to step out on faith before they saw God's provision. Think about the, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant as they entered the Promised Land with, with Joshua at the lead, leading the people now. Moses is gone. And what do they have to do? They have to actually step in the river, and then God parts the water. It would be a lot easier if it was like, we'll just wait till God parts the water. But that's not how it worked. Now again, you may be thinking, well, how scary is it to step in the water? Well, it's a river at flood stage, we believe, at that point. And these people have been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. How much swimming practice did they have? My guess is none of them knew how to swim. And so this is really scary. Stepping into a rushing and just keep walking until God provides, and you're carrying this heavy thing, you are putting your life on the line. But then, of course, God came through. And so over and over again, you can see these examples. I always like then comparing that one to Peter getting out of the boat. It's not like he was practicing in a bucket walking on water. Like, okay, I got the bucket down. Now I'm going to get out and get on the waves. No, no, no. He had to just step out in faith. And in our lives, we're called to step out in faith. And the reason that I want to bring this up today is because God's been doing some cool things in our church lately, and I've gotten to experience God's provision in a neat way. And so I want to take a minute to share that with you, and then we'll actually go through the text. I couldn't decide where to put this. If I put this at the beginning, you won't listen to the sermon. If I put it to the end, you'll forget the sermon. So I'll put it in the middle, so that way maybe you'll still listen to the sermon at the end. So as you all know that have been here longer, back in January-ish, Rebecca, who was on staff here, left. And she had been helping out in a lot of ways. She had been a, a huge support. Um, she had been a support helping Seth and Christy with the discipleship ministry, leading our women's uh, precepts, the teaching. She was helping to make sure that our interims were settled because, as well, I would say as you all know, but some of you haven't been around long enough, pre-COVID, I tended to not be here quite as often. And I would travel once or twice a month internationally doing global ministry. And so we would have these interims here, like Ed and Marion, or uh, Mike and Maggie, and we've had others as well. And Rebecca was always making sure that they, were that they were taken care of, they were settled, that everything ran smoothly on a Sunday morning when I wasn't around. Then Rebecca's called away. Uh, well, her husband is, Yost. Again, I realize half of you may not know Rebecca. So Yost is called um, by Scretting, who he worked for, back to Canada. So they moved there. And somebody came up to me, and I don't, I'm not sure exactly who it was, but they said, David, what are we going to do without Rebecca? What are you going, going to do? And I had this sense of peace, and I said to them, I said, God provided Rebecca out of the blue. He can provide somebody else out of the blue. But we're in the middle of COVID. I'm not traveling. We're not a big church. We don't need multiple staff. And so for now, it's fine. It was very much God will provide in his timing. And for, oh gosh, how long has it been? Like 18 months, 15, 17 months, I have not been on a plane, which I think is probably the longest in my life. And it's been quite a strange um, thing and something my wife has gotten far too used to having me home. So she's not looking forward to that changing. But it was interesting because now, in two weeks, I'm supposed to go to Germany. I've had other trips. They've all been canceled. 
they, they really want me in Germany. It's an executive leadership team meeting for the IBC. The week after that, I'm supposed to be in Paris for the grand opening of one of our churches that's got this new facility that's been built. Um, I hope it's still going to happen. Paris and France is all red. But it's supposed to, we're going to have um, some of MLK's family there. The president of France is supposed to be there. I've told you some of you about this before. I'll tell you more about it when we get there. But it's a really important event for one of our churches. They would like me to be there. And so I'm thinking, okay, i got Germany, the next week France. All these things are starting to happen. And I'm not vaccinated. If I go, um, <laughs> Germany is going to quarantine me from Rogaland at the time. We were looking, looking into it because our infections have been high enough. And so I can't go for a three-day meeting if I have to spend two weeks in quarantine. And then if I have to come back, Germany's trending up. If I had to quarantine, it just wasn't going to work. Not to mention, as God is opening these doors, there's the question of, well, what about the church? God has called me here as well as globally. Right? There's this global thing, global and local. And it's a really unique situation. It's been wonderful. You've been a wonderful church family supporting me in this. As over the years, God has called me to all these things around the world. And he's always taking care of the church. It's always, that's been my first priority, make sure that the church is taken care of. Never want the church to suffer, but the church can sacrifice. And you guys have been great about that. Willing to sacrifice and have me not preaching, have somebody else here. Or, or maybe that wasn't sacrifice. I've got to think through that. Why are you guys okay with me traveling? Now I've got a whole different thought. But it's been a wonderful situation, but I'm going, well, we don't have any interims lined up. I'm, I'm, that's not that much travel this fall. It's just Germany, France, Germany, and Thailand, which if all that happens, that's still, it's not, a, it's, it's not a huge amount. But it was like, it seems like God is beginning to open these doors again and what's going to happen. Well, it was quite interesting because Rebecca's story was that I got an email from this couple, Rebecca and Yost, Dutch-speaking, Canadian uh, English confused third culture people, but anyway, asking about the church and wanting to visit. But Rebecca wanted a place to serve. She had a master's in applied theology, and Yost was working in finance, and Rebecca wanted somewhere to serve. And so I met with her, and they had all, she had all kinds of questions about my theology, and I'm not used to being interviewed anymore. I felt like I was being interviewed, but anyway, we, we had a chat about it. And then um, I talked to Rebecca, and I said, well, you know, you could serve like, as a volunteer just like anybody else. But if you want to come on staff and help out, then there's accountability. I can make you do, th like, you know, tell you you've got to do certain things you don't like doing, and, and, and we can't pay you. And she said, that's fine. I don't need the pay, and I, I want to be challenged. I need to be challenged more than just a volunteer. And so we moved forward with that. The deacons interviewed her, and you all know, I mean, that was years ago, a few years ago now. Um, and she was a great blessing. Uh, oh, which reminds me, I talked to you, Rebecca, two days ago. She said, say hi to everyone. Funny enough, I told her I probably can't do that, I'd forget. She said, well, just say hi to Scotty. And now I'm thinking about it. I never told Scotty hi. Now I'm saying hi to everyone. So I, but anyway, so Rebecca says hi. Um, but so this, this was a wonderful situation that we had had for the time. And God just really provided exactly what we needed at the time for the ministry here and the ministry around the world. So then, a few weeks ago, a young woman visits the church. And I start talking to her. And she's in finance, which was a little bit interesting. And she almost speaks Dutch. I mean, Afrikaans and Dutch are pretty closely related. Right, Carme? And on top of that, she has a, a husband who is a, just finished his Bachelor of Divinity, is trained in theology, and... Um, well, actually, didn't necessarily say we wanted a place to serve, just wanted to meet and ask me some questions, and I got to be interviewed again about what's my ecclesiology and this and that. And I finally said to him, I said, well, what is it God's doing in your life? What are you, what are you feeling led? But I already knew, when I, right when I met Carmen, my heart jumped. I said, this is God's provision. And I actually told Rebecca, I said, don't tell anybody, but God's providing your replacement. And we've been through weeks and weeks of this, and um, it was all on Zoom because... Her husband, Gideon, wasn't here yet, but he has arrived. He went through quarantine. He's here with us, so Gideon, you can wave. So we're glad to have you here in person for the first time. It's the third time we've seen each other because Norway has a weird view of quarantine. Like, they're like, he has to quarantine, but I can come visit him at the hotel. So we met at the hotel the first time. My brother, who's in Australia, where it's like serious, serious quarantine, he's like, I don't think Norwegians understand what the word quarantine means. I'm like, eh, their English is, eh, okay. But anyway, so... So here we have the same, this amazing story shaping up that this is echo of the other story. Carme coming in finance with a trailing spouse. He's trained in theology, looking for a place to serve. I had a similar conversation where I said, you can volunteer. Are you sure you want to be on staff? We can't pay you. 
And he said, well, it's not about the money. And yes, I want to grow. I feel called to ministry. And so I respected that. I appreciated that. So we, we had some talks. Yesterday, the deacons and I went through interviewing him. I had a grueling couple of hours. Although, Bjornar, Sam, R2, we didn't do a good enough job. I talked to Gideon yesterday afternoon. He goes, I didn't feel interrogated. I was like, oh, man. We were really trying to strike some fear. So we're going to have to work on that a little bit. But um, we had a great, a great time with him, and we're excited to welcome him on as our new resident here. And what's even more exciting, so that, I mean, just see how God's providing. But here's, here's it, gets, it gets even crazier. I'll come back to Gideon in a second. So I need to go to Germany, but I have no shots. A few weeks ago, R2 and I were talking, and he's right before him and Du maybe left for the, for the funeral. And I hadn't even gotten one shot because I'm in Sula, and somehow these young people were getting shots in Sanez while those of us in Sula were being skipped over. And then I get called in for a shot. I get my first vaccine. And then they tell me, you can have your second one October 14th. I'm like, well, that doesn't help. That won't even be in time for my next trip to Germany. I mean, this is not good. And so I, I looked at the calendar. And my three weeks was up on Thursday. And you have to have a full three weeks before you get your next Pfizer shot, if it's Pfizer, which means Friday was the first day this last Friday. It was the first day I could get it and it would count. Like that was the earliest. The problem is on the other end, my trip is August 30th. If it was later than Friday, it wouldn't be in time for the German rules, which are harsher than the Norwegian rules for it to be considered fully vaccinated, which is 15 days after your second shot. So Friday was the earliest and the latest. And I thought, well, this is going to be an act of God. So I called Sula one time and I said, can I get a second vaccine sooner? They said, well, are you trying to jump the queue? You can't do that. Which is weird because growing up here as a kid, everybody always jumped the queue. Like if we had those numbers, that's why numbers were invented here, in case you didn't know. Because Norwegians don't know what queues are. So I was really, Daphne, you're shaking your head, it's true, right? Can I get an amen? Thank you. So that's why we have number systems now. It was great as a kid learning to ski in Seerdal and Hovden and all because I would just crouch down and just go to the front. And like that was the culture, like that was okay. So, they're, but they're like criticizing me. I'm like, well, I'm not trying to jump the queue. I just need to take a trip. But anyway, they, they were not nice about it. Then I called again a few weeks later because I'm persistent. And I said, is there any way? And they said, well, we can put you on a list. If we have extra doses, we'll call you. Okay, great. But like there's one day I need a call. That's probably not going to work out. And then I get a text this last week from Kenny, this weird, mysterious text. He goes, I don't know what these Venezuelans are doing. He's like, hey, call this number. If they can get you a second shot. I'm like, <laughs> like I know what's going on in Venezuela with those second shots you're buying. But so I call the number, and it's the center in Stavanger, and they say to me, they're like, well, you know, we don't normally do this. And I said, yeah, and I don't even live in Stavanger. I'm in Sula. I said, but I really need to take a trip for work. And she said, well, we were doing it last week because we had a lot of extra shots. We don't have that many this week. And I'm thinking, okay, it's not going to work. She goes, but I'll make an exception for you. Then she says to me, can you come in Friday? <laughs> so God came through on this. God provided so I got my, my, my second vaccine in time for it to count for Germany and back here and for France, which is fantastic. I feel like I'm free. I am not promising I'm going to come back at all once they let me out of the border. I may just like keep finding excuses, but I don't think my wife won't let me get, be gone too long. But it's just really cool that God provided. Well, a week from this week, uh, I'm going to meet with the finance team. We're going to draw up a new budget. I'll come back to the budget in a minute. And then I'm going to meet with the deacons on the 22nd. On the 29th, we're having a business meeting. And the reason for that is so we can vote on a change budget for Gideon. So that he can be, this will be all be official on the 29th, the day before I leave. Now talk about God's provision, everything in his time. It wasn't early. When I began to agree to these trips, I didn't know how we were going to do it. Just in faith that this is what God's called me to. It's a huge affirmation for me of my ministry and these decisions. It's extremely encouraging. But it's also been very encouraging for Gideon and Carme. And next week you're going to hear a lot more from Gideon. I'm going to have him on stage. We won't do a typical sermon. I mean, you can't hold me back too much. It'll be like a sermonette, which for me is like a normal sermon, I guess. But anyway, I'm going to shorten it. Daphne, stop giving me that look. I can see you. You're not at home. So you've gotten used to watching me on TV. <laughs> so next, um, we're, now, now you threw me off. We're going to next week have Gideon up here. He's going to share his testimony. I'm going to do some interviewing with him, and you're going to get to know him a little bit better on the 29th. We'll have this vote. Now, one of the cool things, while Gideon was willing to serve for no pay, they're not exactly the place Joseph and Rebecca were in life. They're a young couple. They could survive here. 
but it would sure help to have some financing. And so I reached out to the International Baptist Convention and I said, hey, can we get a grant to bring on a guy for a one-year residency? And they've agreed, we'll have to vote on it. You guys have to vote to agree with me. So I hope you don't vote this down, that we want free money. But they've agreed to give us a 10,000 euro grant for us to give Gideon some pay for his time with us. So that's a great provision. And, and Gideon has said to me, it's been a huge blessing because that really makes things a lot less stressful for them, of course. On top of that, Gideon is beginning to work on his PhD right now. He didn't apply for this. He wanted to do a PhD, but, and he can tell you more in person or next week, but God provided it fully funded. It's a distance course he's doing through a U.S. seminary. So he doesn't have to worry about paying for the schooling, which for anybody doing U.S. education is fantastic and amazing. And so he doesn't have that pressure. Now God's providing this grant. But more than that, they had planned to leave South Africa. They were praying about where God wanted them. His plan had been to go somewhere he could study in person in Europe. And when Carme got asked to move to Norway for the job, it was a bit of a, of a they had to think twice. And they, they knew they were being called. They really felt a sense of it. But Gideon told me, he even considered, well, maybe I'm not supposed to do this theology PhD. Maybe I should do something else because, well, at the risk of insulting all the Norwegians here, he said, I don't think there's any Christians in Norway. What am I going to do for ministry? Of course, for that aspect, maybe there's a, more of a need for it. But he was like, I, I don't know that there's any churches. I don't speak Norwegian. How can I work in ministry? What am I going to pursue? And then Carme found our church. I'm not even sure how. You'll have to tell me how you found us. But not that we don't want to be found. Um, but Guinea didn't know. He couldn't find us online. Carme finds us. And anyway, you know the rest of the story now. And so for Gideon, it was a huge affirmation that God was leading them through Carme's job to a place that he'd never imagined that Norway was going to be the place that he could do ministry and do studies. It wasn't even on his radar. And so, again, God provided, God provided, God provided. And so it's been really exciting for me to see this and just to see how God provides just in the right amount of time for every single need. Now, it's, again, it's not always everything we want. It's not always in excess. But it is 100% of what's needed to do 100% of his will. So I'll tell you more about the role next week, but bottom line, kind of the, the basic idea is he's going to be a resident for one year with us where he's going to explore every area of ministry. He'll help to coordinate the service and do some other things. And, um, and then after a year, then that, the grant will run out, but we'll have a chance to discuss kind of what goes on after that. But we're hoping and looking forward to him being with us longer than that. But that's what the IBC residency grant is, and we're doing everything in line with that, which, which we'll explain again next week and then at the business meeting. So it's, it's very exciting and encouraging to me just that God is in this. God is in what we are doing as a church and in the ministry because he's providing. You know, Henry Blackaby, the author of Experiencing God, one of his great truths that he always points to is don't try to get God on board with what you're doing. Instead, look for where God is at work and get on board with him. And we see that. We see God on board with the work we're doing locally and globally that he's providing. We're not forcing this. We weren't going out and advertising. It's just God just brings it all together. And so it's a very, very exciting for us as a church. So let's look at some of the truths we find then in Luke 10. Let's pray and then we're going to come and read out of Luke 10. God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the chance we have to celebrate all that you are doing in our church, in our lives. Uh, in, in my life with ministry and Gideon and Carme's life, Father, we, we thank you for the chance that we have to be a part of this journey. And, and the fact that you do provide in amazing ways, so that we get to enjoy your supernatural power. When you pull things off, that we realize we couldn't have done that in our own strength, that, that you were behind it, you were in it. And we want to always know that because our desire, Father, is not that we just do some good things in life. We want to do the God things, the things that you're calling us to, the, the good deeds you prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. God, that's what we want to be about. And so we just pray you continue to lead us as individuals and as a church in identifying where are you calling us and that we might walk in those things. We pray as we come to Luke 10 now that you would just give us discernment as we read this passage and see the call you have for us to trust you for provision. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Luke 10, starting in the first verse, we'll go through this kind of verse by verse. After the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place he himself was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. 
So here we have in the first verse that they're going two by two. Two by two is, is good for a number of reasons. We know in Ecclesiastes that it's good for people to go at least in pairs because one falls and another can pick them up. There's a practicalness to what God is doing, but also I think it's really important, and I think this is really important for us, especially in Western Christianity today. It's not an individual superstar. He doesn't say, well, Peter, you got this down. You go on your own. Because, I mean, I can maximize my impact. I got 72 guys. Send them all out individually. That's 72 impacts. Pairing them up, that's only 36. But God expects us to do ministry together. God calls us to be a community. There's no lone Christians. There's no lone Christian leaders. And that can lead to danger. And so there's something really wise. God isn't just about quantity. Again, reaching more villages. He's about the quality of the ministry. And so the sending two by two, there's, there's wisdom in that even for us in ministry today to think about what does that look like for us? What does that look like for you? I know that when Scotty, we celebrated VBS last week, and I know that working through VBS, that all the people that were helping out were a huge encouragement. And I know that Jessica, I know you don't want me to like point you out, but you did a lot of meeting with Scotty beforehand. And she just said that was huge for her to have somebody else to lean on, that she didn't feel like she was alone. Like, we need that. We have, that's why we have marriage. God brings, it was not good for man to be alone. He pairs us up. Some people are called to singleness, but overall, the, norm, the most normal is that it's not good for man to be alone. And there was this idea of, of marriage, of pairing up. It's, it's better for two to be together. And so, I, I love the fact there's wisdom, there's a quality of ministry here, there's a lesson for us in that. There also might be a, another truth in it, which is in Deuteronomy chapter 19, in verse 15, it's mentioned that for us to have a testimony that's acceptable, like admissible in court, you have to have at least two witnesses. Well, we'll see in a minute that if the witness of these guys is not received, then they have a testimony against the village, where they shake the dust off their sandals. It's a testimony of judgment because they've rejected Christ, they've rejected his kingdom. Well, for that, for that witness against them to be valid, you need to have two witnesses. And so again, that's, that's one of the reasons perhaps. There's probably a lot more we could get into on the ideas of why it's better to have two. But so he sends them out two by two. And then, we keep reading here. He, after he tells them, he says, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are, laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Do you notice there's pray and go? It's not pray or go. It's not which ones do you want to stay here and pray, which ones want to go. It's pray and go. There is always this tension in ministry in our lives of dependency on God and action on our part. God has what he has promised and he also gives us a certain amount of responsibility, accountability, and authority. And so he says pray and go. And so I wonder for you, which one are you stronger in? Are you somebody that's really great about praying, but maybe don't always take action, takes a little more courage? Or are you one that's maybe, are you have the tendency to take action, but sometimes you don't even think to pray about it first? You just rush in. It's pray and go. And so we just need to make sure in our own lives, our own ministry, and I'm speaking to every single one of you because you each have a ministry. You have a ministry in the home or at work or in school or in the community, your neighbors. We're all called to ministry. Are you spending time praying about the ministry you have? Whichever one that is, or whichever areas, it's not exclusive. It can't be only at home or only at work. No, it's, it's any area God has you having influence. Do you pray before work? God, how do you want me to do ministry today? Do you pray before you get home? God, how do I minister to my family? Now, I, I know I'm not trying to make it legalistic and make it that you've got to like check it off. But there should be a prayerful attitude as we come into doing ministry which is every area of life, we do all things to the glory of God, and saying, God, let me, let me bathe this in prayer. But then also, do you go? Do you act on it? Because it's a lot easier sometimes to say, I'll, I'll pray for them. James speaks to this in James chapter 2, right? Faith without works is dead. It's easy to say, well, well God bless you and fill you, but not actually to give anything. Giving to the poor is a form of ministry. You pray, but you also go. You also act. And so Jesus calls us in our work, in our ministry, to pray and go. When I think about all those stories we were talking about earlier where people walked out and stepped out in faith and God provided, there's always a, a sense, I would say basically always, a sense of prayer 
connected with the going. For example, before Peter steps out on the water, what does he say? Lord, if it is you, call me that I might come out on the water. And Jesus says, come. But he prays and he goes. And so we can't have just one or the other. There needs to be this mutual working together of prayer and action in our lives. And so I encourage you to be reflecting on that this week. What areas has God called you to ministry? Are you acting on it? Because it's really easy to get so caught up in work or home or community things that we're actually not making an impact for Christ. So are you thinking about how does God want me to act in these situations to be in, on, on mission for him? But also, are you praying about it? If you're not sure how God wants you to act, well, maybe if you're praying about it more, he'll reveal that too. He'll reveal opportunities. I remember one time we had a, a Bible study. I encouraged the guys. I said, tomorrow morning, pray before you go to work that God will give you a chance to share the gospel. And then testimonies came back. And one of the people said to me, he said, you know, I, I, I did it because you said to. And then at the end of the day, they're sitting at work. Everybody else had left but one guy. And he starts talking to him and asking, you go to church. What do you think it is that, that means you'll go to heaven? And he's just shocked. And this guy starts asking, well, what, what, is it because you give money to the church? Is it your good deeds? How do you go to heaven? And in and, and his infinite wisdom, he says, you really want me to tell you? See, I'm not naming you Bjorn R because I didn't want to embarrass you. But then uh, but Bjorn had this amazing experience with this guy at work, and, and you've had a lot more opportunities since then to share your faith constantly at work. There's always, you're sharing stories with me of people you're witnessing to. God's opened those doors. And it's just been incredible. So we need to be praying that God would give us those opportunities. He also says he's sending us out as a lamb before wolves, which is not a great picture. It's rather foolish for a lamb to go wandering out with a bunch of wolves. It's rather foolish, of course, unless that lamb has some protection. So Jesus says, not only are you not going to have any, you're not always going to tell them you can't take any provision, and you're at this great risk. There's danger. So I thought about, I actually looked up what would happen if a lion and a wolf got into a fight? Because the shepherd of the lambs is a lion. Maybe I'm taking it too literally. But interestingly enough, there was a website that evaluated all these different things about the, how lions and wolves attack and their size and their strategies. And it summarized it. I won't give you the whole thing. Taking all these factors into consideration, if a lion and a wolf were to fight, the lion would come out on top 10 out of 10 times. The lion is too big, too strong, and too battle-hardened. In a direct confrontation, the lion would pounce on the wolf, pin it down, and do as it pleases with the wolf. The wolf would have no opportunity to launch any offense whatsoever. You see, again, Jesus doesn't downplay the dangers, but he knows that our God is bigger. Just like David had confidence going against Goliath that his God was bigger, the lamb knows that even though there's wolves, there's a lion out there that's going to protect it. And so it can walk in faith that it's going to be provided for. And so we, we keep reading here. Verse 4, carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Now, this was really interesting to me. So they get, they're, they're among wolves. You get no supplies. It doesn't say you're going among wolves, so take a sword or a slingshot or take some, you know, bear repellent. No, 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 you're going to go out there and take nothing with you. Just trust God completely. God alone would provide and this is true trust, because it's foolishness if God himself had not called for it. So God's not calling us to make foolhardy decisions, to do things that put ourselves in danger, right? When Jesus is tempted to jump off the temple because angels would catch him, he says, don't test the Lord your God. So we don't do things that put ourselves in danger unless God calls for it. But in this case, if God directly calls for us to be in danger, he's going to provide. Now, there are plenty of Christians that get martyred, but he will provide whatever is needed for his mission. Paul saw being martyred as being poured out like a drink offering. That there came a day when the way he was going to serve God was to be most likely beheaded and poured out literally. And that would bring glory to God. But until God was ready for that, it didn't matter how many shipwrecks, how many armies, or anything else came against Paul, he was going to survive as long as he had a mission from God on this earth. So again, I'm not saying it's always going to be easy, but he will provide for what he's called you to, which is what should be your focus in life. Now, I also love this one. Greet no one on the road. Did you know Jesus was a Norwegian? 
Like, that's really great to know. I now feel a lot better when I'm walking down the street. Like, oh, all these Norwegians are just being disciples. It's really interesting Jesus says that because in Near Eastern culture at the time, and even to this day, you do greet people, right? It's not like Norway. You do greet people on the road. And some, some commentators think that he didn't mean they couldn't say hi. I think that's because the commentators are writing from their own cultural perspectives. They just can't imagine this. I think he did mean just to keep going. I think there's a couple of reasons for this. I think the number one reason was Jesus wanted them to stay focused. He wasn't wanting them to get distracted. It's really easy to on the roads or talking to somebody and, you know, I don't know what they talked about back then. Like, oh, nice wagon. What model is that? You know, I don't know. But they'd have these conversations and suddenly, oh, look, it's getting late. Hey, can we camp with you guys? I guess we'll get to the village tomorrow. And, and especially, some of you, how many have been in the Middle East? A few of you? Okay, few, very few of you. Uh, if you've had any Middle Eastern hospitality, you know that once you start getting into a greeting, the whole day can go. Like, it, it really can. And that's, it's wonderful, it's, it's beautiful if you have the flexibility for it. But they didn't. They needed to stay focused. I think it was also maybe other reasons for this. God, uh, Jesus, who is God, but Jesus is directly here, did not want them depending on anyone on the road. You know, they might go to a village, he says, and they might get rejected, and they have to go to the next village. Well, after you're getting rejected, and you're feeling down, you're feeling thirsty, you've got no water, you've got nothing else with you, and you're going to the next village, you see some people, you might, hey, do you, do you have any water to spare? Nope. No dependency on anybody else. Now, only because Jesus said it. At the end of Luke, by the way, there's a passage where Jesus says, hey, remember when I told you not to take a money bag or any supplies? In the future, take those things. If you have them, take them. So he makes it clear that God provides things for us sometimes ahead of time for us to use. So it's not that this is how all ministry should be done. This was a special situation. But it is a special situation that helps us to remember that if we don't have a provision we think we need, as long as we're sure that it's God's call, he will provide. And so I think they agreed to no one to stay focused, to mean that they were only dependent on God, nothing between villages to help them. Perhaps it was even a chance to show that they were on mission because it was not culturally normal, and so perhaps others found it quite odd. And perhaps that made it a you know, point of, I wonder where they're going in such a hurry and that they don't want to have time to say hi. Perhaps it was also to raise awareness so that people would begin to have a buzz. Have you seen those, all those different pairs? I saw a pair going to this village, saw a pair going to that village, and they, they don't even stop and say hi. Who are these people? I think there might have been a reason there strategically, Jesus creating a buzz about the kingdom. So we keep reading here, whatever house you enter first, say. So they go into a village and they just go to a house. Now I know nowadays this seems really odd to us. But again, even to this day in the Middle East, this is not so uncommon. Scotty and I have been in people's houses that we've just met. And they say, hey, come to our home and sit down and have tea and have more tea. And yeah. So it says, whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. So someone who wants to, to be at peace, who is open to God's kingdom here. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Now there's a few things happening here. They're told, look, you go in the first house that receives you, that's where you stay, don't be moving around. Why would Jesus say this? Well, it'd be really easy to kind of go, eh, this house is okay, but that house is bigger, is more comfortable. I don't really like the food here. And that may sound silly, but there's plenty of people, even in this day, it, it's a temptation, right? Even if you're doing gospel work to say, oh, but this is more comfortable. And I think there's an amount of God saying, look, wherever he receives you first, that's who I want you to be, to be with and to be ministering to. There's a faithfulness to their response. They've responded first, and we're going to bless that. And then it's, and whatever they set in front of you, eat it. And so it's not always what we like or want. So one of the things about God's provision, or three things. There we go. Oh, back. Help me out, IK. Thanks. Not always what we want. And it's not always when we want it, but God always provides. So Jesus makes it clear. Look, you're going to be provided for, but don't get picky. Wherever you get received, that's where you're at. Eat whatever they give you. Uh, there's even, even some commentary that thinks that Jesus at this point, because he'd already spoken earlier about things being clean, was giving them permission if they're in the house of a Gentile to eat unclean food. It's debatable. 
but it's some commentators believe that's the case as well because he makes the point kind of um, I would say doubly makes the point here he goes on and he says oh and by the way one of the other things these Galileans are foreigners here they're in Judea now so they're in the south and I know it's all like to us it's one country but even to this day when you're in Israel there's an attitude in the south like in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv about those from Galilee they still talk about them that they're kind of yeah they're, they're prejudiced against them just like Nathaniel when he said heard that the Savior came from Nazareth which is in the Galilee area and he said can anything good come from there okay I've heard that type of thing said to this day when I've been in Israel it's amazing how that works but anyhow so these Galileans are coming and knocking on doors and asking to stay they're foreigners here and yet then they're being received the food could have even been somewhat different it might have been uncomfortable for them and then Jesus says heal the sick in it and say to them the kingdom of God has come near to you now what is the kingdom of God it's the vicinity of Christ's domain right so Christ is bringing the healing the healing is by the power of God the gospel is being preached God's message God's good news is coming to them this is the influence of the kingdom Christ comes and we read in throughout the Gospels Jesus preaching about the kingdom the kingdom the kingdom he has come to establish a kingdom his kingdom is not of this world and so as they experience supernatural healing they're experiencing being a part of his kingdom that is we're part of his kingdom we experience supernaturally things differently we, we inherit eternal life we're able to receive the Holy Spirit we're able to, to enjoy so many blessings this is all part of being in his kingdom and so they have tasted of the kingdom and so they are just as Jesus has been preaching throughout the Gospels about the kingdom they are to preach about this kingdom this kingdom of God not one of this world not Jesus trying to set up and overthrow the Roman Empire but a different kingdom a spiritual kingdom but whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you go into the streets and say even the dust of your town that clings to our feet we wipe off against you nevertheless know this that the kingdom of God has come near so they have to proclaim judgment now, that's one of the difficult things for us sometimes proclaiming judgment it's not something we necessarily want to do but it's important that it's done at times people need to know if they're at risk right we, we want to tell people hey you're driving down this road but the bridge has fallen out and you're gonna drive off a cliff we tell them that there's danger ahead and so they don't come in they don't come in lambasting them saying you're all evil and need to repent they come in and say hey God loves you he preaches the kingdom they're going to talk about repentance as well of course it's gonna be part of the message but I'm saying they come in there lovingly excited because God loves everybody right he so loved the world he gave his only begotten son but when they reject Christ they have to say just so you know you're gonna be judged for this and they shake off the, the, the sand off their feet as a, as a sign to them we don't want to carry you with us and so it's something too for us today we have a role in ministry at times of sharing that judgment is coming people need to be aware it's out of mercy because perhaps some will repent I think it's also interesting about shaking the dust off their sandals it's done as a testimony against them but I also think about the fact that they're not taking it with them they're leaving it behind they're moving on to the next place and I think sometimes we in our own lives and ministries are held back because we're hanging on to things in the past sometimes we've got to shake those things off we just have to let it go when Lot was leaving Sodom he was told don't look back but his wife looked back she just turned into a pillar of salt it seems pretty harsh but I think the looking back was more than just a glance out of curiosity to see the the consuming I think there's a longing which is kind of understandable they've been living in this urban life and now they're going off to who knows where having to trust God's provision but she looks back I would say that Abraham's father looked back metaphorically and stopped his journey to the promised land because of the death of his son so very often the things in the past hold us back when there was a young man wanting to follow Jesus he said just let me go and bury my father Jesus says let the dead bury the dead you follow me now that sounds a bit harsh I don't think Jesus is against people having funerals and honoring their family but the point I think there's a lot more there and I won't go into that right now but the point is there's a focus we're supposed to have on following him and not looking back but it's really easy for us to get caught up in the past in various things or even wounds we've had and it can hamper future ministry we just need to shake it off and we need to not take that with us
So again, God is going to provide for whatever ministry he calls you to. You need to stay focused on it, whatever that is. Who has God called you to minister to? Warren Buffett, who's a famous billionaire, I think all of you know the name. He has a famous quote. The difference between successful people and really successful people is that really successful people say no to almost everything. And I think there's some wisdom in that for us. I think we get a similar teaching from Paul in 2 Timothy 2.4. He says to Timothy, No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. The idea is staying focused, staying focused on the mission. It doesn't mean there's not other things that soldiers take time for. It doesn't mean that there's not other things we take time for. But the point is, it's so easy to get distracted, even by good things in life. Like, greeting someone on the road is a nice thing. We're being polite. We're being kind. But it wasn't the God thing. It was good, but not the God thing. And too often, that can be a distraction as well. And so I would say... That this, this idea of saying no is kind of a reminder in, in three ways. We should say no to looking back. We should say no to distractions that would keep us from accomplishing God's mission for us. And we should say no to good things that aren't God things. Now that may sound a little bit odd, but I think there's, there's situations where you think about like King David. He wanted to build a temple. And the prophet Nathan's like, that's great, David, go for it. And he goes home, and God speaks to Nathan when he gets home, and he says, what are you doing? You just told David to build a temple? Did I tell you to tell David? Did you actually ask me? Did you? I'm paraphrasing a little bit. But God gives him a hard time and tells him, you know, you've got to go back and tell David that's wrong, which is never fun for a prophet to have to go tell the king. But he has to go tell David, okay, nope, God doesn't want a temple from you. Well, building a God a temple is a good thing, but it wasn't a God thing. As God makes really clear in the scripture, he had not called for it, he hadn't asked for it, he hadn't commanded it. And so we have to have discernment for what is God calling us to. Which villages is he calling us to go to? There was lots of villages, but these two were sent there and these two there. And what is God calling you to? Where is he calling you to proclaim the kingdom? So is there something in the past holding you back? Shake off the sand and say no to focusing on the past. Are you waiting until you see the provision? Say no to that and, and walk in faith, stepping out. Are you distracted even by good things? Say no to those things that distract you. Luke 4.27 has another great story of this. It mentions how in the time of Elisha there were many lepers in Israel. But it's only one foreign leper who's healed. Healing lepers would seem to be a good thing. But Elisha did only what God called him to. And it wasn't to heal all of them. And so we need to know there's a lot of good things we can do. But where does God want you invested? So here's some next steps as we close. Perhaps, you don't need to do all of these, just where is God speaking to you? Is there something God is telling you to let go of in the past that's holding you back? Maybe there's shame that you don't feel worthy to be a witness and ambassador for Christ. Maybe there's fear because of rejection in the past. Maybe there is wounds that you've experienced. Whatever it is, you need to let go of that so we can move forward. Or maybe that's not your issue. Maybe you need to focus on God's leading. Maybe God's calling you to be more focused on what is he wanting you to do in life? Where is he calling you to minister and to be active for his kingdom? Or maybe God's calling you to stop doing some good things, to say no to some things and start doing God things. I'm not saying you're not doing anything God wants you to do. Don't hear me say that. But I'm saying maybe there's something in your life God's saying, hey, it's not this is bad, but it's taking time away from what I wanted you to focus on. So how is he speaking to you today? Let's pray as the music team comes back up for a final song of response. God, we just thank you for today. We thank you for this passage from Luke, a chance for us to be reminded, God, of your provision. God, may we walk in that. May we continue to move forward knowing that whatever you want us to do, you're going to provide for. We don't need to worry about it. And if it's something you're not providing for, maybe we need to question whether it's what you're calling us to. So God, may we be focused on where you're calling us to go. May we step out in faith and may we see you work in miraculous ways in our personal lives, in our personal ministries, in our church life, our church ministry, Father, both here and around the world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.